Hello you absolute legends. When it comes to speedrunning, Quake is ancient. Alongside its predecessor Doom, it's one of the foundational games that essentially created the entire subgenre of gaming. But what I find most intriguing about both Quake and Doom is not just the fact they are old, but rather it's how quickly their communities reached a high level of skill and understanding of the games. At the turn of the century, most games weren't being speedrun by anyone, so it's hard to compare, but there were a few. For example, GoldenEye and Perfect Dark were very popular in 2000 and 2001, being speedrun by hundreds of people. And of the records that existed around that time, I could beat almost every single one of them literally first try. In fact, if you go back a mere 10 years in most games, you'll find the world records to be light years away from where they currently stand. But Quake is a different story. There are records from the 90s that still can't be beaten. In 1998, Marcus Taipale set a time of 9 seconds on E1M6, which still remains the record 25 years later. Granted, it is a short level, but so is Hangar on Doom. A year after this in 1999, the record for Hangar was also set at 9 seconds, and since then, multiple people have beaten the level in 8 seconds. Many of the Quake records that were set between 98 and 2001 either still remain or lasted 15 to 20 years, which considering the time they were set is simply unbelievable. The early Quake players truly did something special in the way they developed and mastered the game. And one of the most important players from that era was a man by the name of Peter Horvath. Peter set many iconic records in his day, but the one we are going to look at today is his nightmare 100% run on E4M2. In 2000, he set a time of 1 minute and 17 seconds, which was a time that would remain unbeaten until just recently, lasting a full 22 years. What's special about this time though, is that it wasn't just some simple easy run. In other words, it wasn't just trying to get to the end of the level. This was Nightmare 100%, which means playing on the Nightmare difficulty, killing every enemy, and finding every secret. This is the most complex category you can play, and historically the more complex a category is, the further away from the max it is. This is important because if you look over the history of world records, it's almost always the easier categories that get perfected quicker and therefore last longer. Again, going back to Goldeneye as an example, out of the top 10 longest lasting records of all time, 8 of them are on the easiest difficulty, and only 1 appears from the hardest category. So the fact that Peter achieved a time in the most difficult and most complex category that lasted 20 22 years is absolutely astonishing, and is a testament to how good he was all the way back in the year 2000. So sit back and relax as we go back to the start of the millennium and examine one of the most legendary Quake records of all time. I really hope you enjoy. Now legends, before we go on, this video is sponsored by Raycon, and when it comes to earbuds, Raycon are the bee's knees because not only do they sound amazing, but they are also extremely affordable, starting at around half the price of other premium audio brands. Personally, I think Raycons are absolutely essential for anyone who likes to work out or exercise. Trust me, workouts become such an enjoyable experience when you put on a good show, connect your earbuds, and turn up the volume. When I'm walking on the treadmill and listening to a podcast, I can practically walk forever without getting bored. And not only do they sound great, but the custom gel tips allow them to fit incredibly well inside the ear, and they don't fall out even when jumping around, which is obviously a must. They are water and sweat resistant for those that work hard and build up a sweat, and the noise isolation helps me sink away into my own world. Raycons are simply awesome, and there is a very good reason they have over 50,000 five-star reviews. Plus, they are so confident they offer a free return guarantee if you are not happy. So if you're ready to buy something small with a big impact, just click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com legend for 15% off your purchase. Again, that's 15% off. Just click the link in the description. Peter Horvath is a certified Quake legend, creating some of the most impressive and long-lasting demos of all time. The thing that made Peter's demos special is his insistence on grinding and perfecting specific levels, which at the time was basically unheard of. Back around the turn of the century, speedrunning was entirely centered around individual level speedruns. These days, the majority of speedrunners play full game runs, and they might play the same run and the same category exclusively for their entire career. 
But in the year 2000, things were different. Because it was entirely individual level runs, players had so many different levels they had to play. For example, in GoldenEye, which is the game that I started speedrunning in, there are 20 levels with 3 difficulties, which totals 60 different speedruns you had to play. And back then, basically every single player would compete in all 60. Therefore, players didn't have the time to grind a single level for any considerable period. It wasn't until around 2003 that I saw the first real long grinds of single levels by the player Wouter Janssen, who famously would spend over 100 hours playing the same level, which back then was crazy. Nowadays, of course, there are plenty of people who devote themselves to only a few levels, spending years on each and don't bother filling out their entire times page. But years before Wouter Jansen started these insane grinds in Goldeneye, Peter Horvath was already well ahead of the curve in Quake. Peter would spend months and months on a single demo, theory crafting new strategies, finding every possible optimization, and playing for hours upon hours upon hours searching for the best run he felt he could achieve. And he would do this even though no one else at the time was even close to matching his speed. One of Peter's most famous demos was a time of 1 minute on E1M3 in the easy 100% category. This was set back in 2000 as well and would last until 2019. But even then, it was only beaten by a single second by one of the most talented Quake speedrunners in history. And Peter's demo still holds up to this very day, with almost every strategy that he came up with still being considered optimal over 20 years later. And of course, there is Peter's run of 1 minute and 17 seconds on E4M2, into the Nightmare 100% category. Before Peter came along, strategies on E4M2 were extremely primitive, starting with a 235 in 1997 by Nolan Fluke. This is the same Nolan, otherwise known as Radix, that would go on to create the Speed Demos archive that we know today. March of 1998 saw Justin Fleck beat the level in 210, though it wasn't until Peter Horvath's entrance to the stage that we started to see the strategies you would expect in speedrunning. In January of 1999, Peter achieved a time of 142. Admittedly, the overall strategy was still basic, but there were touches of genius. For example, to reach one of the secrets situated on a ledge, Peter used a grenade from an ogre to damage boost and get enough height, a technique now known as a grenade jump. While grenade jumps using the grenade launcher had been used before, this may be the first instance ever recorded of using a grenade from an ogre to achieve the same effect. But the true magic came in December of 2000, when Peter obliterated his previous demo and achieved a time of 1 minute and 17 seconds. This demo is special. Somehow, some way, Peter had crafted a strategy that still today, almost a quarter of a century later, can't really be improved in any substantial way. I've literally never heard of a strategy this ancient holding up this well in all of speedrunning. Some of the tricks that Peter crafted and implemented were decades ahead of their time. For example, his strategy required him to jump up to a platform to reach a portal that sends him to the end of the stage. But it's far too high to reach by jumping. So again, he uses a damage boost. This time he uses homing missiles that are fired from a Vor, and he'll need two because one just isn't enough. This entire end section is just crazy. Upon entering the area, he stuns the Vor and almost kills it to stop it from firing early. He then has to run down the hallway, take out two Death Knights, two Knights, and the Vor while luring multiple missiles. He then has to move in a certain way and time his jump perfectly so that two of the missiles hit him at the same time mid-jump to get up to the platform. If this kind of strategy arose in the last 5 or 10 years, that would be understandable. But for Peter to have done it over 20 years ago is simply shocking. And what's even crazier is that he does the same trick twice in the run. Only the first time, he also adds in extra height by using a grenade from an ogre. I really don't think any kind of explanation can even do this justice, because it's not just about luring missiles. You have to lure missiles while killing every enemy and have them hit at the exact spot you need at the exact time you need. 
so having everything come together like that must have required a ton of work to figure out. Even disregarding how hard this kind of run is to execute, the amount of thought that went into the strategy is undoubtedly many years beyond what was seen at the time. Even the small details that many speedrunners might take for granted today are very impressive to me, like finding the tightest and most optimal angles to lure enemies, making sure you are standing as far away as possible when you fire killing blows. Nowadays players think about every tiny detail, but I can assure you that in the year 2000, this was not the case. Mostly what people were trying to do is just beat the current world record. Progress was generally slow and the result of effort from a group of people making small optimizations over a long time. Sure, big breakthroughs did happen, but I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about these subtle changes in playstyle that only happens after years of progress. And for whatever reason, Peter's demos have these subtle idiosyncrasies that you only see in more modern speedrunning. And by modern, I mean from around the mid-2000s onwards. As years went by, people did consider trying to beat this demo, but it just seemed too intimidating, and there were no obvious ways you could get an advantage. Thus, it would take some new blood, some naivete, for someone to finally give this demo a run for its money. And that fresh blood would come in the form of a Half-Life speedrunner known as Muty. By the time Muti picked up Quake speedrunning in 2020, he was already a master of Quake engine movement, having competed in Source Run's jump cut tournaments and even achieving the Half-Life world record in early 2020. Switching to and from Half-Life, Muti would hone his Quake skills over the next several years, culminating in him achieving the Quake full game easy run record in December of 2022. This dethroned the previous champion, Jukebox, who was a Quake beast and one of the most skilled runners of all time so it was clear that Muti had a lot of skill. And seeing as Peter Horvath's E4M2 record was now 22 years old, it was now one of the longest lasting records ever, and was starting to get more and more attention as a demo that needed to be beaten. Muti decided to take on the challenge. And what's interesting is despite the fact that 22 years had passed, there wasn't a whole lot that Muti could change in the run to make it faster. Because you need to kill every enemy, much of the time is spent shooting and not moving. Moving. So all of those years of movement tech improvements didn't really help much. Faster movement techniques could be used, but only sparingly, and overall they didn't really help save that much time. What Muti really had to focus on was making the run easier and more consistent, because the strategies that Peter used were just way too insane. Any optimization to improve the odds of getting a successful run were going to be lifesavers, and Muti, with the help of another legendary Quake speedrunner Chambers, did find a few. For example, in Peter's demo, he does a crazy 180 insta-kill on an ogre while traveling through this door. But Muti found that the ogre's positioning was too random, so instead he hit a switch to open a door which allowed him to take out the ogre a bit later in the run. Muti also altered the first double vor missile jump, doing it in a different location which allowed him to make the jump without also needing the grenade from the ogre. This lowered the RNG requirement dramatically, but even still, the run is extremely luck dependent, and there's just no way around it. One of the more RNG heavy techniques is an extremely precise shot near the silver key. The idea is to shoot through the tiniest of gaps to lure out an ogre, but the gap is so small you can barely see it. In fact, you can't even see the ogre you're luring. It just so happens its hitbox is large enough to get struck by a nail from around the corner. But the target window is so small, this lure barely works. And on top of that, even if you do wake up the ogre, its animation is random, so it may just be too slow to react. When you watch Peter's original demo, it all happens so quickly it's barely even noticeable. It's not until you actually try to do it that you realize how improbable it really is. Ultimately, once Muti had worked out some of the kinks and figured out exactly what strategy he was going to use, it took around 40 hours to finally beat Peter's record, achieving a 116 on the 13th of December 2022. Which doesn't seem that long in today's standards, but considering that we have a player from the 2020s playing against a player from the late 90s, that's a big deal. And Muti's reaction shows just how special it was that Peter's classic demo was finally toppled. Uh. Oh. Yes! Let's go! Let's go! Let's fucking go, dude! Oh my fucking god! Oh my fucking god! We got it! 
seconds just watching the timer count down. Oh my god, I was like, is this gonna be it? I have to say that it wasn't until making this video that I began to appreciate just how good some of those old Quake demos are. It's entirely possible that when Peter recorded his demo, he was still using a ball mouse. Computers were slower, resolutions were lower, but players still managed somehow to create magic. If you want to see more Quake videos like this, please let me know in the comments. A huge congratulations to Muti on this new record. Please make sure to go and follow him on Twitch. I will put a link to his channel in the description. Thank you so much for watching, you legends. I hope you are having a fantastic day, and I will see you in the next video.